Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space, you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with the advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. And please put unprofessional development in the how did you hear about Podgo? That will give us a little finder's fee. Thank you. Hello, unprofessionals. So as you know, now we're doing real commercials, not just the silly ones that we normally do. So today I've got with me my daughter, Micah. Say hello, Micah. Hi. She has an Etsy account. It's called what? Um, Room Makes Bracelets. Room Makes Bracelets, okay? We'll put a link in the show notes for you for sure. So she makes some friendship bracelets. She even has one that is kind of an unprofessional oh, bracelet where she's made the unpro um, letters in the bracelet. So if you need a bracelet, go to Rue's Bracelets. Anything else you want to say about your bracelets? No. Okay. But she's a little kid. She's 11 years old. She's entrepreneuring, you know, support her. And, um... Go to Ruse Bracelets. Click the link in the show notes. Thank you. Say goodbye, Micah. Bye. Unprofessionals, we need your help. Mealy and I keep trying to explain to the world how special we are, but they won't believe us. Here's what you can do. Check in the show notes for the link to the People's Podcast Awards. And please nominate us so the rest of the world can realize exactly how amazing we are. Enjoy. Professionals to an exciting episode of Unprofessional Development. I'm Tedisco. And I'm Mealy. And today we have with us Sarah Mullen, another one of our guests from across the pond. So, um... Hello. Hey. How are you um, doing today, Sarah? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. And another one that I got to know through the Twitter, I, I, I don't, I think, maybe through Toria, possibly, we've met. I, I don't know where we, how we ended up following each other or get got to know each other Nearly are you half are, the guests you just say i don't know how we met but i know this person i mean i just <laughs> randomly ask people on twitter like i got a text from a wrong number and <laughs> no I th- well actually i think she reached out to me first about the video thing that we made that i don't mm. think that might have been the first like like Real direct contact, possibly? I don't know. Yes, that's right. I think you put a video on Edgy Teacher Tips on the YouTube channel. Yes, yeah, so she's got a YouTube that's channel. Be launching soon. And me and Tedisco made a video with some, you know, that maybe we'll put a link to in that in the show notes as well into the whole channel, but um, <laughs> like really 10 good. tips for being a good teacher or something yeah. like that. Yes. That's right. Yes. So we did, we did that. <laughs> and, and after I, watching and then, that video, she's still talking to us. There you go. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I need to add a huge disclaimer to the start of that video, I think, for all our <laughs> new qualified teachers. <laughs> We're is professionals. It, is it up in <laughs> Is it up in live? I can't even remember. Is it, it did you It's not yet. It's due to go live at the end of July. Okay. But you guys are listening yes. in either August or September. I have no idea when this one's coming out. In the I future. Don't... Yes. <laughs> From the world really? of tomorrow. You could be listening. Exactly. You could be listening in the year 3000. You've uncovered this from some weird internet archive. Anyway. Uh, from a place called America. <laughs> yes. America. Sarah, can you uh, just start us off by giving us a quick walkthrough of, so how did you get into teaching and, and what was sort of your educational journey that brought you to this place? So I became a teacher because I came from an Irish working class background. And my parents had always said to me, you know, education is the key to opening doors for your future. If you've got good grades, the world's your oyster. Mm -hmm. And I saw that myself by working really hard at school. I went to a really good university in Belfast and I did really well. And um, so that's why I went into education, really, because I wanted to give other people the same opportunities that I had to education. And that's kind of what I've carried through. So when I was working as a teacher, after a couple of years, I became a school leader and led a school in Birmingham, independent school in Birmingham. And then I wanted to have a far-reaching impact then. So I worked with teachers, training up new teachers. 
and working with people that want to become school leaders themselves. So I wanted to have like a greater ripple effect. And now more recently, actually, I'm working with educators globally. So hopefully some of your listeners on this podcast will uh, come to one of my conferences out in Dubai as well. It should be good. Cool. Wow. That's just a constant expansion. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You have an empire, it seems. <laughs> so where um, do you go next? Teachers on the moon? Yes. That, that could Books be. on the moon. Yes. Talk to Elon Musk. <laughs> Well, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, we should have him on the podcast. Um, so Sarah also has a book that I think we're going to get to in just a little bit. But um, the name of the book and some of these things, I think both for British people who are maybe just getting into teaching or possibly listening who aren't teachers, as well as Americans, there's this alphabet of acronyms. And so I said, why don't we have Sarah, since she knows all about this stuff, Break down some of these things. And the two big ones I want you to kind of talk about are NQT and PGCE and kind of walk us through how you go from or what the different paths are to becoming a teacher in England. Because in America, 99% of us go to a four-year college and major in education, and then we do a student teaching stint for about four to six months as part of that, getting that degree. And then we are in the classroom, 100%, training wheels off and go. And I feel like England has a few more steps towards that. So can you kind of break that down? Yes. Yeah, so um, there is a, a program you can do a bit like what you've described in America. So you can go through once you finish school or you go to university and you become, can become a teacher through your undergraduate degree, which eventually leads to a degree in education. But lots of us tend to go and read a subject. So I studied to do English literature, or some of us might have gone to do an education degree. And then you can do lots of different routes into teaching. So one of the routes, which is quite a popular one in England, is called the PGCE, the Postgraduate Certificate of Education. So it's a year-long program where you'll spend a little bit of time at university doing modules in pedagogy and theory and teaching you know teaching stars safeguarding that kind of thing and you also spend quite a lot of time in schools so it's almost like if you were training to be a nurse or a doctor spending a bit of time in the hospital and a bit of time at the university okay and then once that's one of the routes there's lots of different other routes as well that you can go in which are the same way then once you've done that year you get your teacher certificate and you go into the school and your first year when you're in the school on your own and your own classes you're trained to become a newly qualified teacher. So that's a year we have a lot of support. You have lots of training. You have a mentor and you build yourself up. But really in England, what we always say is that even though that's one of the routes to training, you never really stop learning. So even mm -hmm. now I've been teaching for almost 17 years and we're still learning, still training. And we say mm -hmm. the best teachers always are. So although that gets your certificate and that gets you your title as a teacher, you know, we say you never stop learning. Okay. So the, I guess the biggest difference is then is that that newly qualified teacher year where you have a little more, um, you've got your own class, I guess, or your own classes if you're teaching, you know, on a higher level, but you, but you have a, a smaller load or the same load as the rest of the teachers. So as a newly qualified teacher, you'd have a lower teaching timetable. So you'd have about 90% of the timetable. Okay. And that just gives you a little bit more time to hone your craft and learn from other people as well you also get great support from your schools where you're given um time to work on courses or to learn from other people as well so it's about giving new teachers the training and support they need mm -hmm. to you know become really confident and well skilled in the classroom but i don't i don't understand so when do the teachers feel like they're drowning and cry themselves to sleep <laughs> Oh, I think behind closed doors, probably most of us do. And that's why places like Twitter are so good, because people can reach out to other people and, you know, have a critical friend or a study buddy that they can offload to. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's honestly a really nice feeling when you're a new teacher and you realize, oh, OK, everybody's struggling. Yes. Like, uh, uh, at least we're all drowning together. Yes. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and this is—I don't know if you're the same. If you're the same sort of. Um, when I grew up, was studying anyway, things like well-being or mental health and workload were not in our vocabulary whatsoever. It was no. this is your job, and if you're struggling, work harder, work yes. longer. You know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Uh huh. I've um. There's a phrase I, I I use a lot. I I learned actually when I was working in construction, um, when we were asked to do um extra things and extra things and extra things. The phrase is "Don't worry about the mule, just load the wagon." And that seems to be um <laughs> like a philosophy of people who are in supervisory roles. You know, like oh, you know, they keep let's loading just, it on. Just keep loading on. I mean, don't worry about the mule. Just load the wagon. And if the you know if, if the mule gives out, there'll be another mule. We'll just we'll just have that, hook them up to the wagon. And and um yeah, but I do think it's getting better now. I think people are starting to talk more, share more. And I think especially in England, people are starting to realise actually if we're doing something that doesn't have a direct impact on the children, mm-hmm. is there really any point doing it? Right. And just re- you know, so I think that's quite good that there's conversations are happening and, and movements are starting to happen. Yeah, awesome. I, I I agree. I do think teachers are starting to also realize and say to each other, "Hey, it's okay. Like yeah. tomorrow, your lesson can be medium. You don't have to have a rock star, unbelievably fantastic lesson every single day, and then end up to this girl said crying crying in a puddle somewhere and being horrible for the next three weeks because you're just you know like." Pace yourself. Just, just you want to you want to do a really good job, and you want to give the students what they need. But you also have you also know that you only you're a human being, and you only have so much energy and time you can have. Do you ever find as well that you would I would do a, you would do a lesson, and you'd be observed. So somebody from senior would be looking watching your lesson, mm-hmm. and you'd be pulling out all the stops, jumping around the classroom, all these different resources everywhere. And yes, it would be a great lesson. They'd write great things about you. But actually, when they left and you went back down to doing your normal teaching, that's when the kids were learning more, actually. Yes. And sometimes you realise if if you could be observed and judged on your long-term impact that you've had on those children, <laughs> you know, yes. some of my best lessons have, have, some of my best lessons have been all singing and dancing, but some of them have been when I've sat there and just had a conversation with the children and then they've written an essay about it. Yep. Going back to what you were saying about the mule and the cart, mm-hmm. and I think now that, you know, so many of us, you know, around the world are, are stuck at home, I think people are starting to really reflect globally about all of the things that we put on schools to do for our society. You know, how schools are the place where we feed our, our poor children, how schools are the place where we deal with mental health issues, schools are the place where we deal with behavioral issues and education and all of the rest. Right. Yeah, and I, I think people are starting to, to really weigh out all the things in the cart at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, but kind of back to what um, Sarah had said as well. I can't remember the details of it, but I had this lesson planned. And I had, you know, this activity and this fun thing. And the kids were going to move around and there was going to be some – somehow there were colors involved. I don't bells remember what. Bells and whistles. I mean, bells, whistles, dogs, ponies, everything, you know? <laughs> And so, like, like I present things. this to the guy on my team. I go, look at this. And, like, here's the thing. And here's the sheet that they're going to work on. And here's what I'm going to do. And here's some video thing. And, here, blah, blah. and he looks at it and he goes, that is really, really good stuff. But what we need them to learn is da, 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 da. Do you think they'll really learn this by doing all of that? And I'm like, oh, you ruined it. Like, it was going to be a lot of fun. And now I know that it's not really good. It's so you know? true. It is. It's like, there's, oh, look, there's, there's going to be fireworks. You know, well, fireworks. Is, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't a lesson with fireworks be awesome? Yes, but you want them to learn Pythagorean theorem. Why is the fireworks going to help them learn Pythagorean theorem? I don't think it will. But. But I don't care. There'll be fireworks. Remember when they leave, they'll tell their parents they had fireworks at school. Yes, but they won't learn what we're trying to get them to learn. And so yeah. <laughs> we get caught up in it sometimes. But, you know, anyway. That's it. And the hours that we spend as teachers making these lessons and the resources for maybe a five-minute task in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and we're really, I think we're really starting to have these conversations now and it's having an impact. Yes. I've been sewing this costume of George Washington <laughs> for, from hand. I grew the stuff. I, I've got a sheep and I sh- sheared it and I made my own sweater so it would be authentic. And so when I walk in, they'll see what George Washington really <laughs> wore. So I spent the past And that'll two- get us through the do now. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and it's also like all the new technologies we learn. Oh, I just I, I spent weeks practicing and learning and figuring out this program so I could do this lesson and, and this sort of new online program. And then a week later, there's a new program out that completely <laughs> negates all of your hard work. Yep. <laughs> <sighs> so true. All right. So, Sarah, I got another question for you. So sure. you put together a book. <laughs> which is very as an English teacher that's very very impressive so like what was that process like and how fun slash obnoxious like was it like what was sort of the process for all of that well it started off it was just going to be my book and it was just all the things that I sort of learned on my journey that weren't taught as part of the, 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 the course because they couldn't possibly have been. The things like, you know, when a wasp comes into the classroom and you have to just stop your lesson <laughs> because everything goes out the window. Um, just little just little things like that. And as I started to talk about it, more people were sharing their ideas. And so I thought there's something really powerful here about the, the idea of a story because I can tell about my journey, but wouldn't it be wonderful to collate the journeys of, hundreds of educators mm -hmm. so it's a, a shared powerful voice and some of the that's why some of the narratives are, are along the same theme some might even contradict each other some might be different i thought it just shows that actually no two days in education are ever the same mm -hmm. um so i did this on this is on maternity leave and i thought well i've always wanted to write a book I've, I've got this plan i've got this book deal in place this is my time to do it and it kind of just took off from there so i tweeted one evening and said look I'm putting this together. If you'd like to write for it, I'd love to have your stories. And overnight, it had something like 83,000 views. Wow. Yeah, it, it went, it just went really, you know, really, really, really wow. well on social media. And luckily, it's, um, people have, you know, invested so much time and energy into sharing their, their stories. So I'm very grateful. That's cool. That's cool. And so I'm going to kind of like hit you with some of the things from the book. And I don't, the book is, how how many different? I don't know if you would call them chapters. They're more like passages, I guess, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, they're like yeah. they're little, maybe three hundred to to thousand word essays that people have written about every aspect of teaching you can possibly think of, and and <laughs> many you never have. So I'm going to guess that you don't have every single one of those um, memorized, right? No. <laughs> but but I'm going to kind of give you these prompts and see if. And you can actually, I'm going to give you like uh, three of them. A choice board. Okay, we'll do a choice board. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so, and see if one of these three or multiple of them gets you going. And you can talk about some of the things that are um, in the book and maybe, um, you know, help drum up some sales for you as well. The, 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 the unprofessionals <laughs> that are listening go, ooh, I want to read more about that. So the the three that i had that kind of jumped out to me as i as i went through the book and i haven't read the entire book because it as 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 you've mentioned this is not this is more like an encyclopedia i guess or a dictionary type thing yeah. not like a like start here and end end here book where it's like oh i just yeah. want to read about this topic or that topic or these things yeah. that find me interesting so um the three that stood out to me are um behavior management finding your why which i think that might would have been what it did you actually wrote and then um, asking for help. So of those three, behavior management, finding your why, or asking for help, you've got the floor. Go and go and speak on whatever you want to say. Do you know what? I'm going to go with finding your why, not just because I wrote it, <laughs> but because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. Because we, when we apply to be teachers, we put in our, we call it a personal statement in England. So it's like a, about, I think it's about 500 words where you have to say why you want to go into education. Or if you apply for a job, you have to do your application form and write down why you want to have that particular job. And then you get into the role and everybody's going to have ups and downs, good days, bad days. You're going to work with staff who you work really, really well with. You're going to work with staff who perhaps you find more, more challenging. <laughs> so I think it's really important to always remember that why and to periodically remind yourself why you're doing the job. And when you go into a really stressful moment, so if you have got a task, if you are sitting at home cutting up worksheets and you've been doing it for an hour and a half and you know it's only going to take 10 minutes in your lesson tomorrow, look back and think, is this why you went into teaching? Is it because you wanted to have beautiful resources or is it because you wanted to make a difference to your children? And actually, would you be better to pack up, go and get a good night's sleep and be well rested for the lesson tomorrow? Yes. Because yes. actually... Your children probably prefer a rested, excited teacher 
and someone is exhausted because they've been chopping up bits of card. Yes. And if you've had a challenging evening as well, so if you're um, if you're in the classroom and you know you've had something really challenging that's happened that day, and you reflect and think, well, actually, it was really really tough what I had to deal with, but that child's going to remember that I helped them with this for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. That's really really important use of time, and it's something that you can go home and feel really proud of, even mm-hmm. if it wasn't on your to do list. Yes. Yes. So I think that's really important. I think many of us probably are driven by um, wanting to contribute towards social change and help people have better future, better outcomes. And I think that's that's a really, really important driver for me, I think. Okay. Well, that's really cool. The closer we stay towards our why and and remembering why we're there and why we're teaching, the longer we last and the happier we are. Right. Yeah. I think as well, in England, it's... um, We see it as one big sector. So you would work in a school and you might then move to different schools as well. And I think it's about finding the school that's the right fit for you at the right time. So you might find that you've, you know, you've exhausted your path in a particular school and then you might move on because you want to make a difference somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think it's always knowing when that inner core driver is and knowing when it's your time and the right role for you as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And knowing why you do is so important. Yes. So... What if a teacher comes to you and says, well, here's my why. The reason I became a teacher is so I could try and get high test scores and yell at children. Is that, is that a good, is that a good? (laughs) No, I'm glad. I mean, that's really why I became a teacher. I want to have high test scores and yell at children. I didn't know any other place I could do that other than in, in school. So I figured I I would. I love screaming at the young and I hate money. So, Hilarious. between this and being an orthodontist. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I'm also... sure I've interviewed lots of teachers in my time, and luckily I've never heard that said. But <laughs> I think it's interesting too, though, how a lot of teachers probably, if, and if you're listening to this and you're quite young in your career or you're just going into your career, a lot of teachers are always worried about their degree grading or their lack of experience in a certain area. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important as well to look to that passion and to look for somebody who can, you know, that they're not the finished articles, none of us ever are, but they've got the right heart and the right mind and the right energy mm-hmm. that they're going to get there. So sometimes, if it, you know, interview somebody with a first class degree, we'd call it over here, um, who just maybe wouldn't have the same energy or the passion as somebody who, you know, isn't as experienced or hasn't got the same degree classification, but, you know, has got so much more to bring to the classroom. Yes. Yes. I, I'll tell you this. I am so thankful. The first year, I didn't really know him that well. But years two, three, and, and since, there's someone um, at my school, and he, know, he knows who he is. And there's, and there's a few others. Neiman, we, we had her on, and, and she was one, who just, he was the teacher I saw, I felt, had, he had a similar why as me, I guess, is, is, is kind of what it, what it comes down to. Because there was other teachers that I saw that did stuff that I'm like, oh, I could never do that. But I found someone who would help me find that balance and to listen to things. And the, the biggest thing that he really helped me out with is going, this is a really big deal and this is not. Meaning there's things that you get an email or um, there's something that's mentioned at a meeting and it gets your blood boiling and you're really like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they're going to make us do that. And all of a sudden you're just like crazy about it. And he would be the one that I would look to and he'd be like, don't worry about that. It's A, you'll be able to handle it. B, that's not something that they're going to like really be consistent with or check on. And you don't need to, you don't need to worry about that. And then the other things like, oh no, this is something that we need to gather together and we need to get our voices and we need to go to administration. So it's sometimes it's nice to find those people when you're young or you're new. So yeah, I kind of piggybacking on what you were saying there. Finding that person is, is super important and it really makes a difference in your longevity and being able to, to stay because there's so many challenges the first few years. And Sarah, it yeah. kind of sounds like that's you're trying to be that person for a lot of teachers. Well, I think, yes. So I do a lot of... I have a lot of people approach me for asking for help or advice and I always think I just ask me anything and that's kind of the very nature of the CPD so the professional development that I do with teachers and with aspiring leaders when I do my CPD for teachers it's all about being really honest and saying we've all been there we've all had tough times we've all had really you know great times as well 
and focusing on that why the, the development. I think it's a kind of a slightly different angle. It's less corporate. It's more down to earth. It's more face to face and looking at real practical advice and tips that can help teachers progress. That's mm-hmm. what I'm really passionate about. Oh, that wasn't on our list, but so so let's let's go there for just a second because it's sure. nice to talk about this stuff philosophically and broad generalities, and we need to and we should and, and think about this. But like, teaching good, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what is one thing that you go, hey, like a specific practice that actually in the classroom or preparing to be in the classroom do this one thing, like a teacher hack or whatever you want to name it. That's good. Um... <laughs> I would say focusing on feedback. Mm -hmm. So focusing on what specifically will move the child forward. Okay. So often as new teachers, we will get the exercise books and we will squiggle under every spelling mistake and we will circle every letter that should be a capital and we will put down 10 things that they've done well and targets for improvement. Mm -hmm. And we're focusing on improving that particular piece of work if they were going to do it again. Right. Chances are, they're not going to do that piece of work again. Mm-hmm. But if we were to give them a specific one piece of key feedback that could help them improve as an individual, it saves not only our time, but it really helps the child move on. That's good. That's good. Whether it's golfing, whether it's some other kind of sports or activity, or bowling, for those of you that bowl, or you're teaching a kid how to ride a bike, you can't tell them the five things that they're doing wrong and expect them to improve all five of them. They, they, the, the, their brain will explode. And if you can just say, <laughs> they will, you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to go, okay, here's the one thing, like you said, with the feedback, here's the one thing that's going to help you the most. If you can do this, then, and we'll get good at that. Well, the other stuff, we'll, we'll get to it eventually, but we don't want to, we don't want to worry about that right now. Let's, let's, get you so you understand this or so that you can do this and we can work on this skill and i think as teachers as well that's that's something for us to remember you know what i mean you're trying to like you go and there's like nine things that you're trying to to do and it's like no just you're trying to improve how you deal with this kind of kid whatever it is but don't try and don't come to don't don't have like a list of 17 things you're going to like going to do differently this year just pick one focus on that and work on that and then kind of do a little by little so that's 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 good i I had an observation once where um they were looking at a kid in my classroom and said you know this kid sat there the whole period with his head down and i said i know (laughs) like that's bad i'm like no he didn't get up or curse at anybody he didn't start any (laughs) fights that's a huge improvement (laughs) i've been working on that kid all year Mm -hmm. and you know what this is this is a plateau we've hit. Yeah. yeah. And it's that relationships. So knowing each individual child's motivation and circumstances. And that's probably one of the most important things to establish straight away. Um, and all mm-hmm. the other stuff will fall into place. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Absolutely. And, and Excellent. while we're here, Sarah, I was wondering if I could just ask you. So you talked about how the why is so important. What's your why? My words to say is giving every single child the chance for a brighter future and to achieve their, their dreams and their goals. Aww. And I think it, we do we do an awful lot about pastoral care, which is really important in schools. But actually, if we can make sure every child leaves us with a good set of results that they can go on and you know achieve whatever course they want to go on to or job they want to go to, we know that we've done the best we can for them. That's great. Excellent. I, that actually does remind me of a funny story. Actually. Go for it. <laughs> I I knew a teacher who was a special education teacher, and she had that same philosophy. I want to make sure the child can achieve their goals, right, that they have, they have realistic, achievable goals, and I'm going to work with them, whatever it takes, in order to make them, them reach it, no matter what, what sort of disabilities or issues they had. So they had an uh, IEP meeting where they were meeting with, you know, the parents and the child, and uh, it was the start of high school, and they said, okay, so what do you want to do as a career? And uh, it was a girl. She said, I want to be a stripper. <sighs> and so the teacher said, well, let's talk about a path to get there. Oh, <laughs> that's, wow. That's your realistic goal. I mean, that's a job. It can pay bills. It, it does. <laughs> Helping wow. every child. <laughs> so, that's a conundrum, and I don't know how I would handle myself within it, but that's how they chose to handle it. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah, that's that's um. I don't know how I would handle that. I've had a student <laughs> tell me that before that that was that was the plan, you know, and I, I'm it's like, better than being jobless. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's not a long term career, you know. At some point, you want to move into management, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on before we continue to mortify our guests. Okay. <laughs> All right, Sarah. So uh, we've told some, some funny things, and we know ridiculous things happen in the classroom. Uh, and and then professional developments and just whatever we deal with. You know, humans, they're silly. So do you have any sort of funny stories you wanted to share with us or, or even stories that, that you know of from, from other parties? Because I know you, you collaborated with a, a large group of people. Well, the next book actually is called Chronicles from the Classroom, and that's full of hilarious stories oh. and true stories as well. Ooh, when's it's that one really, So that one should be coming out around Christmas time. Okay. Ooh. It's, oh, it's really good. So we've got people, we've had, you know, projectile vomiting children mm-hmm. who've yep. leaned over their teachers to have their books marked and then been covered in vomit. We've had <laughs> teachers warning not to wear your flip-flops to school because if there's vomit, you're bound to step in it. Oh. We've had other... <laughs> We've got birds flying into the classroom. And a funny one, this is true, actually. And somebody on Twitter, I cannot remember the Twitter handle now. The summer holiday's just gone. She was handed a, I think it was a duck as a present from a child. So, a live duck. Can you imagine? Oh. I, I, I don't know what I would do with that. You're a great teacher. Yeah. I bought you a wolf. It's in a cage outside. Yes. Yes. I mean... Just take the duck home. That is so. Yeah. <laughs> do they do they work in a rural area, or you don't know? I'm not. I'm really not sure. Really not sure where it came from, but hilarious. Wow, I've never gotten a duck. Lots of Starbucks gift cards is what I get, and I don't drink yeah. coffee, and I don't know what to say when they when when I don't when they. I ducks. I I regift them. What you want? Du- you want a duck to disco? You can't really regift a duck. <laughs> I mean, did you're, it come you're... with a gift receipt? Yes. <laughs> Bring it back to the pond. <laughs> Okay. Is there any more, like, did you want to get into any specific stories, that you, like a real good one? Did you want to give us, like, the details, like, A to Z of one of the stories that's going to be in the Chronicles from the classroom? Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a, a funny story from my own, actually, that I haven't shared very often. Okay. And that's when I was a new teacher. So I was teaching a class, and the teacher had gone on maternity leave. Mm-hmm. So she was, um, I was there, and I was, I think, I was either a student teacher or I was in my first year of teaching. And I had this class, it was an exam class, and they were quite challenging. And they really missed their teacher that was going. So one lesson, anyway, they were all talking, and they, nothing, no matter what I did, I couldn't get them to listen to me. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly, the class went completely silent. And so I started to look like, have a, you know, something on me or what have I done wrong. Mm-hmm. The next thing, I had a look, and one of the children, no joke, was climbing out of the window. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so he was there climbing out the window. We all got up to have a good laugh. We were on the ground floor, so it wasn't, doesn't sound quite as bad as it was. He climbed okay. out the window, ran around the school, and came back in the door to the classroom as well. But oh. um, And then years later, I was in a shopping centre, and his girlfriend at the time, I think she was still his girlfriend, had served us in a restaurant. And I just remember saying to her, do you remember that time? <laughs> Your <laughs> friend did that in my best friend. <laughs> you know, it's one of those moments you think it's my career over before it started. <laughs> yes. yes. I had a friend who did that when I was in high school. He was like messing with his pencil and it flung out of his hand and went out the window. We're on the first floor. So he just went, ollie oop, and hopped out the window, got his wow. pencil, walked around, knocked on the door. One of my other friends opened the door to let him in. So this kid who'd run around the school came in and sat down. And my friend who'd opened up the door closed the door, and that got the teacher's attention, and he got in trouble for being out of his seat. <laughs> Luna hopped out the window, no idea. <laughs> so funny. It is. It is. I've never, I've never climbed out a window or had a kid climb out a window. I had, my first year, I had kids throwing stuff out the window. I was on the third floor, and I definitely had some kids making airplanes and throwing them out of the third floor. Um, and I didn't even know it, honestly, because I was a first year teacher. I was like barely aware of what was happening in my classroom. Yep. And it was a janitor that brought it to my attention and said, Hey, do you know your kids are like throwing, um, airplanes out the window? Like, I think, I think they might have been knocked on my door. I don't know. Said, Hey, you see this? Like this, you know, someone just threw this out the window. I'm like, Oh, okay. Stop that, please. Yeah. Teenagers you know? are dumb sometimes. Yes. Well, I did the thing. 
where you would take the backpack off their shoulder. They've got like the backpack on one shoulder and you just knock it off the shoulder. And now it's in the crook of their arm and they ah, down there and then they put it back on the shoulder. And then I just do it like three more times. So um, I do that to students in my class as well. It's, it's fun to do. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just an idiot, basically. <laughs> but do you have that when um, school leavers on the very last day of school do something really crazy at school? Is it like, yes. It's like a rite of passage here in the UK. Oh, yeah, senior pranks. Do stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, where they've turned, like, they'll go into the classroom and turn absolutely everything inside out or take all of the furniture from inside the school and leave it out on the outside grounds. Or... Mm-hmm. Good stuff, good stuff. So is there anything, Sarah, that we haven't covered in terms of the book or something you want to plug? Or Oh, the only thing I'll say is that the PC book, I'm releasing it to the same content, but mm-hmm. internationally. So okay, it'll have a new title. So it's what they didn't teach me in teacher training. Okay. Um, because of the acronym, I think a lot of people internationally don't necessarily put their teaching degree with that. Mm-hmm. So that should be quite interesting. Okay, and, and when is that new version coming out? Do you know? Um, as soon as it's done. So we're hoping September. Oh, cool. Um, soon. But it's just a case of going through and, yeah, hopefully. Um, we just wanted to add in now a section on teaching during a global pandemic because mm-hmm. that <laughs> yes. obviously wasn't thought as part of our teacher training. Yes, definitely. Well, we just really appreciate you being on here, Sarah, and thank you so much for um, coming. And we just enjoyed talking to you about teaching. And um, we just want to tell to our unprofessionals, stay unprofessional. Thanks for listening, unprofessionals. Next week, we interview entrepreneur Bruce Dixon talk about what got him so interested in creating a nonprofit for education and wow is it a wild conversation so please tune in next week to hear more about bruce dixon and today we have with us bruce dixon okay so who's bruce dixon you don't know already well he is according to his resume Polymath, social entrepreneur, nonprofit CEO, corporate director, and global citizen. Okay, so I, you know, um, that's a whole lot of stuff there. So apparently he's he's everything and a bag of seven chips. So um, how are you doing today, Bruce? Uh, terrific and wonderful, and in, 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 in that in that order. In that there we order. Go. <laughs> that would be alphabetical order, just in case for those following at home. Um, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, who's the, who's, who's the math and who's the English? I'm math. I'm okay. English. Well, I yes. heard me. Fair yes. enough. Yeah. yeah. So, but I like English and he likes math, so it, it, we, we, we both kind of, we're, we're, we're not, neither one of us are, um, I don't know if we're all the way polymaths, but we're, we're poly somethings, okay? Uh-huh. That's, well, that's interesting as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm polynomial, well, I guess. It, it, I was going to say, it sounds like a different podcast, however. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not we're not neither of us are polyamorous. I don't think. Oh, okay. To, to I, just no, go, no, so. You're not right. No, I'm not. No okay. Judgments. <laughs> no judgments, though. Huh? Not at all. Like, right? yeah, interesting. Whole another <laughs> interesting Seinfeld. conversation. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know. Some days I'm polytheistic. We could. We we do. Yes, and I mean, we're definitely polysyllabic. Um, oh yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and do you need a napkin to wipe that away from your life? I do. I do. <laughs> Oh, so, so ladies and gentlemen, so Bruce has very many, I don't know, charitable and entrepreneurial um, ventures. So we decided to do something a little bit different today. And so I don't have the music and we don't have an aquarium, <laughs> but we're going to play Shark Tank. Okay. No, it's okay. We're on a podcast. We do have an aquarium. We rented it. It is beautiful. It's well, right behind it us. It yes. is absolutely beautiful. There's tiger Thank sharks. You, there's great whites. All of those barracudas. Couple clownfish. There were yeah. more yes. clownfish, but we let the sharks in and there are speaking fewer of, clownfish now. Speaking yeah. of that, Tadisco, I was talking to my wife. I'm like, okay, she, which one of the...